Okay, <clears throat> reminding us where we are. We're in part one, the general information. Uh, <coughs> the last session I discussed what was in uh, part, uh, in chapter two, which is the deficiency section and how you might figure out what your deficiencies are. Uh, chapter three is, gee, now I know what my deficiencies are, where do I go from here? So it's, uh, it's called rehabilitation. This slide is incorrect. It says 2.1 and 2.2. It's actually 3.1 and 3.2. But this chapter is organized very much the same way that chapter two is. Uh, there's some introductory material. And then just like we talked about evaluation standards, we talk about rehabilitation standards. And uh, just like before ASC 31, uh, ASC 41 is becoming more and more uh, typical. It, of course, it is a standard, but that doesn't mean that everybody uh, Everybody has to use it. Um, the mitigation of evaluation deficiencies, uh, you, you know, you, you have to think about it a little bit, particularly if you're going from, say, ASC 31 to 41, because uh, they're not directly connected, as you know. Uh, we currently have an ASC committee uh, that is the joint committee between 31 and 41 that are going to try to make them the same or make them directly connected, but right now that is not true. If you are using a evaluation standard also for your retrofit standard, then it's, it's pretty obvious to go from one to the other. For example, people have used ASC 31 to retrofit a building, and what they do is they simply look at all of their falses and their answers, and then do something to mitigate to make all those answers true. And by the time they finish, they say, well, if when I retrofit this building, it will meet ASC 31, so therefore it must be okay. Uh, it was never intended to do that, but people uh, have done that. We also know that people have used this 75% of the code, and when they do that, uh, how they handle the old existing and archaic elements is unclear. And usually it's some negotiation with uh, the building department. If you're using nonlinear analysis, uh, the conditions may change from your evaluation statements, uh, so you have to be aware uh, of, of that difference. Um, so the counterpart of the seismic deficiency categories uh, is the classes of, uh, of measures. And the classes of measures you can see here, the first one is simply to add elements. Uh, that for years and years and years, that's pretty much all we did when we retrofitted buildings. We simply put in new elements. As I mentioned this morning, in the very early days, we simply put in a whole new system. We then soon figured out, however, we could get some benefit from the existing components in the building, and so we may not have we put in a combined system using both the old and the new elements. Um, so here's an example of uh, of adding elements. We'll talk about this building a little bit more detail uh, later in the day, but this was a dormitory building. Uh, it was a non-ductile frame built in the 20s that had clay tile around the perimeter. Um, it's a double-loaded corridor uh, dormitory. And in order to prevent uh, disrupting the finishes in all the rooms, we picked uh, uh, two rooms in two different places in each wing. Blew out, blew out all of the, the rooms and put in a concrete core. Uh, the, the cores actually had windows and doors and everything just like the walls did before, so when the students came back, they just walked in a the room. They didn't know uh, it was any different, but the lucky students that were in these rooms were obviously safer than all the rest. But, but, but the whole building survived the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake, so it must be okay. So that's a, a classic example of adding elements. Uh, here's some other classic examples from San Francisco. I'm sure you have similar buildings here. We had an unreinforced masonry ordinance and the, the uh, inexpensive method that was discovered, or not discovered, but after some trial and error, everyone started using brace frames to fix these buildings. I'm not particularly enthralled with this one on the, on the right in terms of the angle of the braces. It's not my building. But nevertheless, it is an example of, uh, of adding components. If you walk around south of Market in San Francisco, you'll see literally hundreds of buildings with brace frames in the windows. And here's a case where, because it was near the entrance of, the, of a store, uh, the, you know, a 
moment frame was added instead of a brace frame. Here's a gigantic steel column, uh, two uh, girders in order to get sufficient stiffness. So that's another example of simply adding a, an, an element. Uh, so that's a class of uh, uh, an easy way to, in our matrix to say, gee, if you really want to do the most straightforward thing, and not, not always the cheapest thing, but if you want to do the most straightforward thing, uh, why don't you just add something? So that is the sort of the first category. The counterpart to adding something is enhancing what's already there. You could enhance a lateral force resisting uh, element like a shear wall. You could make it, give it more shear strength or you could enhance the uh, displacement capacity of a gravity uh, system. So uh, those are examples of uh, doing that. Here is a case where we were enhancing uh, the shear capacity of a concrete wall with, uh, with FRP. We'll talk about this in, uh, in more detail later. Uh, another classic example is to, uh, is to provide confinement to gravity columns. There's many other examples of uh, making an existing component work better in your building rather than adding a new one. Uh, you can actually provide confinement with FRP to beams as well as columns as well as shear walls. Here's a prototype of a, of a building that we had actually designed the retrofit for, but it turned out for reasons that never got built. But in this case, you would want to round out. This was a square, squarish column, rectangular column. You would want to round out the, uh, the shape, you know, put FRP around uh, here, and then there's a you drill a hole through here and there's things called horsetails, which are just groups of strands of the FRP material. You shove it through this hole, spread it out on either side and epoxy it to the FRP and you end up getting the whole tension tie that goes all the way around. This also works if you're trying to confine a column and there's a wall coming into the, to the column. You can't wrap that all the way around and you don't get the confinement if you only put it on three sides. So you really need this to, to make that uh, tie. <coughs> the next, uh, the next uh, category uh, or class of improvements is to improve the connections between components. Again, here's a URM uh, with the obvious plates outside. This is the most straightforward way, as Brett will tell you later in the day. There's many other ways to do this, but this is the most obvious uh, 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 way to improve that. Uh, load path uh, problem. Here's a more uh, complicated case. Uh, uh, this is a uh, six-story building uh, that's an academic building and the first level uh, is a, a testing bay. It's actually a civil engineering building and when the engineer uh, built this building uh, he, he had to leave out this space uh, <coughs> for the tall testing machines but on the floors above, rather than putting in a transfer girder, uh, transfer columns and girders for, to create short spans, he just left this large span and put large uh, plate, steel plate girders to span this on every floor above. And then he put precast T's spanning between the plate girders, and then he put a topping over that whole thing. And the topping was very poorly reinforced, so when all was said and done, you basically didn't have a diaphragm uh, that was worth a darn uh, on any of the levels of this building. You can see that there's very skinny uh, connections at the ends and this connection here is penetrated by a large uh, uh, elevator shaft or stair shaft. So there was a lot of concern that if you look at this building in either direction uh, that, that the uh, ties uh, uh, at the ends would not hold the building together this diaphragm was worthless and so this building could very well split down the middle and virtually start to fall apart. If it started to fall apart then the plate girders would lose their bearing and the whole thing would collapse. So it was definitely co uh, considered a, you know, a, uh, a collapse problem. So you can look at the building in either direction and come to the same conclusion that it's a, it, you know, it's a loser in either direction and so <coughs> the the, the building would perform significantly better with simply if you didn't worry about the thing splitting apart. So we went up to the upper floors and here's where the, uh, here's where the plate girders are uh, going across and we made a pretty massive tie under those plate girders. They're pretty big plate girders uh, 
and then tied this well into the diaphragms on both sides. So these are simply tension ties across. <clears throat> so we wouldn't lose uh, this, uh, this diaphragm would not deflect between the ends and start to separate the building. So that is kind of a different kind of a load path issue, but nevertheless, it is considered a load path is issue, a connectivity issue. Um, uh, so they, they don't always come with just out of plane uh, uh, wall connections. Reducing demand, uh, we talked about isolation or damping. Uh, here's a very obvious uh, uh, and, and observable uh, damper that was put into a uh, bus terminal in San Francisco. This is actually a street going through it. This is, they knew this building was going to be replaced, so it wasn't, there was no aesthetic concern. So uh, here's a damper on either side. <clears throat> so when the building moves back and forth, it is damped uh, by this uh, brace frame structure. There, Jim will talk about other moment frame buildings uh, where damping has been added to, to cut down the displacement, which cuts down the rotational demand on the moment frame connections. And then uh, isolation, you have a very uh, uh, prominent uh, example of isolation uh, right here. Uh, but on the left is uh, uh, San Francisco City Hall, uh, Oakland City Hall, LA City Hall. Uh, we have also in California Pasadena City Hall and Berkeley City Hall, all of which have been fixed with isolation. You may wonder why is it city halls that always seem to get fixed with isolation? Well, one reason is because all of these areas were in post-disaster FEMA grant areas. And isolation, as you know, is very expensive. But if you get a little FEMA money uh, in the post-earthquake environment, you can afford to do some of these things. Uh, the city, the Oakland City Hall and San Francisco City Hall were very, very high cost per square foot. They're beautiful jobs, but they were expensive. Uh, in the upper right is uh, on the Berkeley campus. It's uh, Hearst uh, uh, Memorial the Mining Building. Uh, it's a beautiful uh, old building. It's actually unreinforced masonry bearing walls. Uh, and uh, the whole thing was isolated and very little work was done in a superstructure because there were so many bearing walls that as long as we tied them together, there was actually enough shear capacity uh, that we, we found uh, to use that. So the, pr the preservation was, <clears throat> was quite uh, good in that case. Uh, the, the classes of rehabilitation measures last is removing selected components. I have an example here of a uh, steel frame building, I believe it's about uh, eight stories tall. You can see it's, it's a very nice, unit, what we call a universal moment frame. Here's the column line there, there's a column line there, and exterior columns. There was columns and girders in both directions, so you had a nice moment frame. However, it was an early moment frame, uh, so it was a little bit on the flexible side, and there was a uh, concrete stair tower at this end that was apparently not considered in design and it was pretty much tied in, and this building had a severe torsion problem. This end was wagging around quite uh, poorly and was, was uh, over-rotating all the connections. One of these walls in that tower was also discontinuous, so you had a deficiency of a discontinuous wall. And lastly, since this stair tower was taking almost all of the shear in the building, they were all overstressed. So this stair tower was doing us no favors, uh, so we said, well, let's just take it out. So we disconnected all these walls, being careful to leave the fire protection there. And when, once we did that, this became a very regular and symmetrical steel moment frame that worked. Uh, and there was no load in the wall, so we got rid of the other deficiencies as well. So this is a case of uh, less is more. If it's really troublesome, consider taking it out. So that's yet another class. Again, in all of these tables that you'll see, uh, these, these classes uh, of rehabilitation techniques are across the top. So you look at your deficiency, and then you look at the various ways that you might want to consider doing it. And then that will direct you to a technique specifically that talks about that uh, issue. There's also some strategies to develop rehabilitation schemes described in chapter three. You want to understand your deficiencies by looking at your evaluation and their interrelationship. Sometimes one technique will, uh, one addition of, uh, will solve more than one problem. Uh, so you, have, you want to be 
efficient in, in your strategy uh, to, to see if you can solve all your problems with adding one thing or, or, or using one technique. Um, once you come up with some rehab scheme, and a rehab scheme is very much like designing a new building, you, have to, you know what the system is, you don't know what all the sizes are, so you have to assume something and get your analysis started. The rehab scheme is very similar. You have to come up with a trial scheme somehow. Once you do that, before you start spending a lot of money modeling it, we suggest that you go through this checklist to, to make sure uh, that your scheme has considered all of the potential issues. So it's, it's just a, a useful thing to, to, uh, in, the, in the process of uh, creating a rehab scheme. Um, I have found actually though that there are non-technical issues that often determine uh, what your retrofit scheme is because in the end you have to satisfy the owner uh, and the owner normally has five basic issues. They're always concerned about the cost of the scheme. Sometimes they're concerned about the exact seismic performance. They're always concerned about the short-term disruption if the people are going to stay in the building. They're concerned about the long-term functionality. They don't want a shear wall down the middle of their auditorium, for example. And sometimes they worry about aesthetics. If you could go into the owner before you started and said, you know, give me an importance of every one of these things, uh, you would come to the scheme, fi the final scheme, much more quickly. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to do that, even though you sit down with owners at, with some length, because they, it's hard for them to react until they actually start seeing some schemes. Uh, here, here is a real live example of how uh, these issues affected one particular building design. We started with this eight-story non-ductile frame building uh, with sort of the classic, uh, you know, owner's importance first, the construction costs, make it very inexpensive, make it a hero, you know, I want to be in the building right after an earthquake. I mean, that, that's what everyone wants, right? Good performance for no cost. And these other issues are, you know, were in sort of afterthoughts. So this is a plan of the building. So looking at these characteristics, we said, well, the cheapest thing to do is to just get in here and put some concrete shear walls in. Uh, and here's some locations. You might have to compromise your windows. You'd put a littler window in here or something. And so the owner saw this and we started thinking about, well, we could build this uh, from the bottom up and you'd have to evacuate three floors at a time because if you work on the middle floor, you're going to be affecting the floor above and below. And he started looking at that and said, no, I don't think that's going to work. Disruption is way more important than I thought, so let's put that up right next to construction cost. And performance, ah, you know, if it doesn't fall down, that's all I'm really concerned about. So we started coming up with going to the outside of the building, uh, around the perimeter, to try to minimize uh, the disruption. Uh, and again, you looked at this and you could see that even though you were working from the outside of the building, some of, these, some of these issues were going to affect the inside. So uh, all of a sudden he said, well, I think disruption may be the most important thing of all. Because the fact of the matter is, I thought about this, and even if I go out of the building one floor at a time, I have no place to put these people. I'm going to have to rent a new office building across town. It's horrible, horrible, horrible. That's the only thing I want you to worry about, is keep the people in the building. Don't worry about anything else. Um, so, so we ended up with, you know, with outside towers, and of course the problem with outside towers is that uh, you always have to connect the building to the tower some, somehow, so you actually have to go inside the building often to get a collector, and there's been many, uh, many projects that I have seen where a person, an engineer thought they were going to solve this problem by being outside the building, and then they were, uh, they finally figured out by the time they got their drawings done that they needed a collector and had to go in the building anyway. So in our case, um, this was the actual uh, blueprint of the building. We, we went to the outside of, the, of these towers at every level and we drilled a, a hole down the middle of a 12 by 16 inch joist, about 20 feet deep. Uh, we came in and epoxied uh, the end of the, of the high strength Dewadag bar, pre-stressed it so we got the reaction on the inside where we needed it so this wouldn't pull out of the, of the concrete, and then grouted the rest of the bar, 
uh, and put these towers on. And the fact of the matter is the drilling was done at night. Uh, the, the, no one even had to cover their computers. There was no lost time, so it worked out fairly famously. Uh, and the architects gussied up the towers here to make it look sort of like the original building. Uh, this is pretty much all fake. These windows, uh, there's nothing inside this tower because he couldn't afford to fix it. Uh, so these, this tower is, is largely a shell, but it provides the, the shear walls for the building. There's other exterior solutions. We're going to talk about this one a little bit later. You can do exterior solutions in steel. Uh, here, here's one in concrete where the buttress is going in and out of the building and there's a moment frame in plane. It's not totally clear to me how they got the collectors of the buttresses, but there's various ways of doing it. Um, here's a church in San Francisco that we did that um, we had a lot of trouble with this gabled roof. There's no ties across here. This side of the building was doing one thing and the other side was doing this sort of breathing. So we finally ended up with these flying buttresses. These guys are actually new concrete retrofit of this building. Most people that go to this and see this building do not even realize that these were added after the fact. Uh, here's another uh, version where the aesthetics were not quite as important. It was just to be effective, and another exterior solution. We keep going. Here's an unreinforced masonry building in San Francisco. You can tell with all of these out-of-plane anchors at the floor lines. And at the front of this building, which there's no picture, is a brace frame, but for reasons which are not totally clear to me, uh, at, the, at the other end, it was decided to put what we call a bookend, a concrete C-shaped element uh, that wraps around the building, and it's sort of a combination shear wall frame. Here's a more massive bookend. Uh, this is a very long building, a large building uh, at University of California. The gray is new concrete, so there's a massive C-shaped bookend at each end. Um, most, of these, uh, most of these buildings were, in fact, done with the uh, people inside. Not always happy people, but nevertheless, they were inside. Uh, here's a lift slab. Uh, lift slabs, as you know, uh, uh, have serious issues with drift because the connection between the steel tube supports and the precast concrete slabs are not very deformation tolerant. So this was a uh, condo building and the owner could not kick the people out to, to put collars around every column. So we had to stiffen the building from the outside. Uh, so uh, w these, these are new concrete elements. So there are a lot of versions of this uh, outside uh, uh, strategies. Other common issues that we talk about in chapter three, uh, not always solving your problem, but giving you things to think about. The constructability issue, uh, materials testing, how much, how much testing do you have to do of the existing uh, structure. Uh, disruption to building finishes and systems, not necessarily the noise disruption, but if you, in many buildings you go in, you're gonna disrupt the mechanical system or architectural finishes that are very costly to replace. You got to worry about concealed conditions. No matter how well you know the building, you will typically find the contractor will find a condition which you didn't know about or didn't think about. So you should uh, have some uh, resources uh, during construction to deal with those conditions. Uh, quality assurance issues, uh, peer review issues. Uh, again, the, the detailing of new elements. Uh, right now, ASC 41 in most jurisdictions will say. If you're gonna put a new component into a building, it's gotta be detailed in accordance with the minimum requirements of the new code. Even though ASC 31 would tell you or would give you a methodology to design the element with poor detailing or less than perfect detailing, the rules of thumb, or the, actually the rules in the standard right now says detail it in accordance with the, with the uh, new building. We put this in this book simply because that seems to be a question that comes up. Uh, there are some uh, techniques that you use, particularly base isolation, where the building might be very vulnerable during construction. This is typically a contractor's issue. He's the one responsible for uh, the building during construction, but the engineer has to be aware that there has to be a way to do what your drawings show uh, that's reasonable. Otherwise, the cost of temporary shoring or bracing may be, uh, may be greater than your entire uh, scheme. Uh, another thing, uh, 
that is important. If you have a very large job and there is no information about some component, some acceptability criteria in ASC 41, you might very well consider testing. Uh, most testing uh, issues in the laboratory, in a university, are in the fifty dollars to $100,000 range. Uh, there are several instances where much more than that was saved in the building because the testing indicated that either you had to do nothing to the component or you could do much less than, than you thought uh, uh, originally. Uh, incremental rehabilitation means uh, doing a rehabilitation over years and years by doing a little bit at a time, perhaps associated when you're remodeling or the classic case is re-roofing, you, you fix the roof diaphragm. FEMA actually has an entire series of documents on incremental rehabilitation. Uh, there's one general one that tells engineers how you set up uh, the, the uh, retrofit procedures that you want to get done. You have to think about which ones could get done independently because you can't do anything that makes the building worse. So there's a lot of preparation to, to lay out. There's a FEMA document telling you how to do that. And then there's one on different building types like schools and hospitals that talks specifically about how this could be applied uh, to that building type. So that's also uh, highlighted in this chapter three. And then I mentioned several times these issues with new techniques and products. Um, uh, you, you will find that when someone comes up with a new uh, adhesive or some uh, use of, of FRP in some way that you're saying, gee, I wonder if anybody's ever done this before and if they did, you know, what are the issues? Are there UV issues? Are there corrosion issues? So <clears throat> we have a very nice checklist um, uh, of questions to ask you uh, that you should be asking the vendor in all probability or you should be asking yourself as to whether this product really will perform uh, as you think. Questions on the vulnerability chapter? I mean on the rehabilitation chapter, I'm sorry, chapter three. Gee, is it that clear or is it that too dark in here? Yeah. Uh, yeah, all the, 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 the discussion of all these elements, of all these issues are in chapter three. In a paragraph, it's not a, it's not a chapter, but <laughs> there is some discussion about it. Yes? What's the usual cost for this uh, rehabilitation? Well, it, it varies a great deal because some buildings just need a little bit to be done and some buildings need a lot to be done. So it's very hard. FEMA actually did some, if you look back in that uh, FEMA resources, there is a couple of documents about the cost of rehabilitation. They collected data from, from all over the country, from engineers. Uh, they put it in, in model building types. So you could look at a model building type and an age and it would give you uh, some samples. But the standard deviation of the, of the information is huge because it just, there is just nothing, not very much commonality. As I say, sometimes you add one shear wall, sometimes you add 10. So it, it's very, very difficult. But uh, I mean, it ranges uh, on the low end, maybe, uh, well, in a tilt up, there's very little you have to do. Typically, you connect the, uh, the roof to the walls. It might be four or five dollars a square foot. Uh, and it goes all the way up to fifty dollars a square foot uh, or more. What often happens as well is an owner is going to spend uh, 30 or 40, 50 dollars a square foot uh, and disrupt his building. He says, well, by the time I'm, he or she says, by the time I'm going to do this, I want to go in and fix that lobby and put in a new auditorium or whatever they're going to do. So there, there's a lot of other uh, construction usually happens with it, which kicks the cost you know, up. So it's very hard to subtract and get the actual cost of the rehabilitation. So it it's varies all over the map, but all that is discussed in this FEMA document, uh, so you get some uh, some clue there. Other questions? Okay, we'll charge into the real meat of the thing here, uh, part two, which gets into the actual techniques, and the first chapter of part two actually talks about the model building types themselves for those people who are not aware uh, of how that works. There's some history of where they came from and what other documents use them. Uh, and in fact, how the model building types, the, 
that we use might be slightly different than the ones you've seen in other, uh, in other documents. Um, here's some refinements. It turns out that every, almost all of the FEMA model building types uh, have two versions. There is a, f a rigid diaphragm version. You can see the S1 steel moment frame here. Uh, this S1 is a, is a rigid diaphragm. S1A is a flexible diaphragm. Believe it or not, there are some older steel frame buildings around that have wood floors. Uh, so there are such buildings in the world, but we are not going to deal with them in this document. So we took out most of these uh, flexible diaphragm things. We took out uh, steel light frames, the so-called butler buildings, because uh, they hardly ever have a problem, even if they have all kinds of seismic deficiencies. So people don't retrofit them very often. So we didn't think that was a resource we should spend. We didn't want to spend our resources on that. Um, importantly, we thought that concrete shear wall, which in FEMA is one type, C2 is really two types, so we broke it out into those shear walls which are uh, like motels and hotels, double loaded corridors with, with demising walls all being concrete. Uh, we call that a C2B for bearing. And then the more typical uh, concrete gravity frame that might have a flat slab or, or waffle slab or joisted floor on columns might have a few walls here and there or might have a perimeter punched shear wall. That's a more typical shear wall building and that acts a lot differently than the bearing wall building. Uh, so we've split that up. We also did some tinkering with the reinforced masonry buildings. There's one type that's very much like a tilt-up and almost everything we say about tilt-ups would apply to that. There's other, uh, there's other buildings that are more like an unreinforced masonry building, uh, and so we've made that distinction. Right, so this is all simply described in there. Then we go through, again, have these diagrams and descriptions, and uh, I'm just using this to indicate what's coming. The very, very small W1s are not really covered. That's houses, essentially, although many of the techniques Kelly will talk about for the bigger buildings also apply to those small buildings. Uh, chapter 6, the W1A and the commercial buildings, we, we pretty much cover, we think. Uh, the steel moment frames and steel brace frames, Jim Malley's going to cover later. Uh, the steel frames with concrete shear walls, I mentioned, as somewhat unusual building, and actually they're usually pretty good, so they're not, very, they're not retrofitted very often. We are not covering that. It's, there's a chapter on that, but we're not covering it today. Um, the steel frames with infill masonry uh, walls is an important older structure. There's quite a few around. Uh, we have a chapter on it, but we're not covering it in the seminar. Concrete we're covering fairly completely. The moment frames uh, uh, we're covering. Again, concrete frames with masonry infill. It, there's a chapter, but we're not covering it today. Uh, the bearing wall and the uh, gravity frame shear wall systems we, all, we are covering. Tilt-ups we're covering in pretty good detail. Precast uh, we're not covering. We could write an entire book the size of this one on precast alone, uh, and we did not do that. Uh, we didn't. We wanted to spread the resources out a little bit, and uh, uh, not covering the reinforced masonry very much, except by referring to other uh, uh, documents. Uh, the, uh, re again, the reinforced masonry bearing walls are similar to the concrete bearing walls. And finally, URMs uh, we're covering in some detail uh, by Brett uh, later in the day. So that's what's coming.